contributes to your stool and makes the stool the very, like gives it a very different kind of configuration. And I call it the rear. So that's what was created there. So a classical example is cholera toxin. And this kind of diarrhea, even if you don't eat, even if you don't eat, it's all that you still stew. Even if you don't eat, you still stew. That's why cholera is one of the most dangerous kind of problems in lactosis. And we wrote the reason the most dangerous kind of problems in lactosis diarrhea. And every kind of diarrhea is always compared to cholera diarrhea. Because even if you don't eat, even if the person does not eat, the person keeps on what? Stew. That's a security kind of diarrhea. But the other kind of diarrhea is called osmotic kind of diarrhea. Osmotic kind of diarrhea, let me go first. In osmotic kind of diarrhea, you see it in situations where you have, normally we define osmosis as what? The movement of water from mm -hmm. a region of what? Yeah, High concentration of blood concentration. So it's like a pool of water also into the blood. Now, this is basically because of mild digestion. Like my, Digestion is not going on properly in the stomach. For secretory diarrhea, we are talking about absorption of water. So we are talking about when the intestine or the ileum is having a problem absorbing water. You know, normally when you're taking water, you're taking your food, after a breakdown, the body does some kind of adjustment to maintain the processes. Whereby important elements, the important nutrients are being absorbed, including water. Including water, but I think the water is what is taken back. So that's where we have secretory problem. So in this kind of osmotic problem, you don't have a you don't have an absorption problem, you have a digestive problem. So you have mild digestion. So you see this kind of thing when you have lactose intolerance. So you have a patient having lactose intolerance, you have somebody having fructose intolerance, or you have a patient having celiac disease, or well, then we know we still define this kind of disease. But these are examples where you find osmotic diarrhea. And in osmotic diarrhea, it's called that if you take away the cause of that thing, the patients will become better. So if your patient is having lactose intolerance, that means the patient system cannot digest lactose. If the doctor discovers that this patient is lactate, lactose intolerant and you remove the lactose from the meal, the patient becomes normal. Unlike secretory diarrhea, where even if you take, you don't, you don't want to resource, it's not and the digestive problem, it's an absorptive problem. We also have what's called exudative diarrhea, which is blood when you have mucus and blood in the stool. You see substance shibidosis and salvatosis and when you have bloody diarrhea. Inflammatory diarrhea is what inflammation. Inflammation is when you disrupt the normal mechanism of the cell, if there is infection, viruses, bacteria, fungi, any kind of diarrhea, we call them inflammatory kind of diarrhea. But there's also one kind of diarrhea they call high motility diarrhea. Like it's it's high motility diarrhea, that means the food is rushing down. The food is coming down the jet track very fast. Like it's not filled with normal so it's very, very fast. So it's not properly digested, it's coming down very fast. You find such things in patients that are on a gun or go Or sometimes you see, it's also a part of complication, some kind of menstruation period. Sometimes people, it's a complicated, it's a complication in menstruation where you have that kind of diarrhea as one of, it's a very rare situation. So that's where you find that kind of diarrhea. So I think I, when I'm talking about the treatment, I would, I would try and lots of time try and work. So lots of time I'll just try and thank you very much. Sorry, I, 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 is there a actually? Here, um, there is. There is actually a disease. If you say like, it's a disease because it's caused by something. So it's a disease. You know, people class, but it doesn't have a broad class people like this. That's the last thing you see. There is a disease. Or no, we can call it a disease because it's caused by an organism that causes it. And it's a disease. Yes. 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 Yes.
be associated with a number, of, like for, for example, a hundred or more diseases or conditions can be associated with diarrhea. So in that sense, um, diarrhea is a symptom, not a disease. Um, and then again, uh, there are types of diarrhea. Actually, when we look at why are diseases referred to as diarrhea, we have to look at two factors here. We have to look at the frequency of the bowel movements as well as the consistency of the stool. And um, Dr. Heath Ke Dr. Ken Ethan um, at the University of Bristol developed a scale which consists of seven categories in which medical, medical um, physicians and medical staff use to categorize the form of human stool. And uh, it has seven um, categories. So diarrhea is considered, uh, it is considered diarrhea if the stool has formed um, six or, no, six and seven, those types, which is like, like six is more of, type six of, uh, is more of a mushy and fluffy stool. It's not exactly liquidy, but it is very soft and mushy. And in type seven, we find that the stool is very liquid. It's actually more liquid. There's no solid particles in it at all. And then if we look at uh, frequency, like my colleague said, um, it's three or more bowel movements within 24 hours. That is what you consider it diarrhea. And of course, there are three types of diarrhea. There's what we call watery diarrhea. And this is three times or more um, liquid bowel movements within 24 hours. Then again, there's what we call dysentery. And um, when I first started studying about diarrhea, I thought dysentery was a disease on its own. It's actually a description of a type of diarrhea. It means there could be blood or mucus in this form of diarrhea. And then we find persistent diarrhea, and it's normally associated with chronic conditions. Um, it lasts for 14, more than 14 days, and conditions you can find this type of diarrhea include inflammatory bowel syndrome or, um, for example, cancer of the small intestine. You can find tiny diarrhea in these things. And then, um, Many uh, factors have been associated or disorders. I mean, many disorders or um, pathogens have been associated with um, causing diarrhea. So um, there are so many types of bacteria. Um, but to name to name a few, there's Vibrio cholera, Shigella, E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Jenny, um, Yersinia, Enterocolitica, and uh, Staphylococcus, just to name a few. I don't want to bore you with a big list of bacterial agents. Then there are also um, viral agents. Oh, and before I forget, there's also what they call the travelers um, diarrhea. And it is caused by the enterotoxigenic E. coli. And it's very common. It causes 80% of travelers diarrhea. Uh, then we have viral agents such as rotavirus. It is known to kill more than uh, 500,000 children under the ages of five per year. Uh, they developed a vaccine, but recently it has been taken off the market for reasons I don't understand. Well, I haven't looked into it. Okay, there's also parasitic uh, causes, for example, Antimoba histolytica and uh, Giardia lambia. Those are the common types. And other conditions uh, that could cause diarrhea include metabolic disorders such as diabetes mellitus, there's um, pancreatic insufficiency. There could be um, hyperthyroidism or others call it Addison's disease. And food allergies are also known to cause diarrhea. For example, lactose intolerance can cause diarrhea. Um, antibiotics, some antibiotics have side effects that can cause diarrhea. Um, as well as uh, irritable bowel syndrome. It is known to cause um, quite an annoying type of diarrhea. As well as food poisoning um, and Vegetal uh, neurosis. Uh, this is not a digestive disorder in itself, but it is a neurological disorder that can cause diarrhea. So this is just to give you a brief scope of what it can cause and something. So just to give you an idea of where we can find out what conditions can cause it.
how they come here. So as the Marx did to tell us the etiology and the pathogenesis, how these diseases cause their here. So let's put on this to tell us the Now for the 
product of classification of diarrhea diseases, non infectious diarrhea diseases. This is where we have diseases as a result of maldigestion, malabsorption, other problems in the pancreas, there is a chronic exocrine portion of the pancreas, and many patients have an intolerance, as I said, intolerance to like pancreas intolerance, fructose intolerance, celiac diseases, insulin intolerance. All this can lead to non infectious diarrhea. So, in the non infectious group, we now have like the maladaption diseases, maldigestion diseases, and the lack of fertility diseases. We are also now, apart from this, we also have the other one we call inflammatory bowel syndrome diseases. The inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis and the Crohn diseases. These are, as in, these are chronic diseases, but they can also have their symptoms as the real life symptoms. So, ulcerative colitis, those diseases are also seen as non infectious kind of diarrhea. Okay. These are more like the etiologies. Then, the pathogenesis of diarrhea, as we initially said, could be either significant, osmotic, or inflammatory and invasive. For significant, can you just come up in the general etiology? What happens inside the moment of the It means that. We don't see how we can do it at the end of the day. Right, right. So, general, so for the pathogenesis for secretory diarrhea, we have the, what happens is, for example, virus or infection or enterocosigenic E. coli, these are the most common ones that are used in secretory. When, when you inject the toxins, the virus or produces a toxin called cholerogenes. Okay, then these toxins have the way of alternating the sodium potassium pump in. You know what sodium potassium pump in the cells of all the GI tracts? When the sodium potassium pump is alternated as a result of stimulation of the adenine cyclase enzymes, this now causes the production of sodium ions, and this sodium ion by osmosis will attract water to itself and cause increase in the water motility from the GI tract. And the patient is going to have this water in the so for this, also the secretory diarrhea, you don't really, it's not, it's not, it's not invasive, like it affects the mucosa lining. It doesn't affect the mucosa lining, it's just overproduction, at least to certain potential form of impairment. If you do not pass out, and the patient has it. But for the osmotic diarrhea, as a result of osmosis, so when you have uh, too much of these uh, osmotic molecules or substances in the GIT tract, they try to attract water to themselves and they cause osmotic diarrhea. Like in case of malabsorption syndrome, malabsorption syndrome, and problem with mattress, where the enzymes are not produced, so the digestion is not complete. So the water is being carried with the osmotic molecules. Then for the inflammatory, the inflammatory diarrhea uh, makes this a result of mutation or rupturing of the mucosa lining. Remember the, the GIT tract, the small intestine is mostly responsible for absorption. Now when the mucosa line, the uh, microvilli that eats in the absorption is being um, damaged, the absorption rate reduces and the water is now being excreted out in this form. So this is basically the etiology for inflammatory diarrhea. Thank you very much.
contaminated surfaces or formites. Like, for instance, if you go to the toilet and you don't properly wash your hand after that, you go to probably your kitchen, pick up something, put in your mouth, you can actually get it through that means. Or maybe you have some dirty stuff that you didn't, your plates, your cups, you can get it through that means to when you use it to eat. So it's like it could be from animal to person or it could be from person to person. You as a person, when you pick up something and someone else uses it and it's already contaminated, the other person has the tendency of getting the diarrhea. Even though it's not like you had contact with the person like to get it so people can get it through, through that means or for okay, like they were talking of diarrhea in children and they have killed so many children. I would say the reason why that happened is because you know children like playing around, they touch surfaces and then no proper hygiene, no proper washing of hands, and you see them they put anything into their mouth. So through these means they can easily get it. So we have, we have like different means of transmission outside you just eating something or through your plates or like it could be through your food, cooked food, you probably went out to eat something and it is not properly prepared or in a very good hygienic environment you can actually have diarrhea. So I would say the Major, the primary mode of transmission of diarrhea is through paper or a root. And like they said before, you can also get diarrhea through use of some medication, but I guess someone else will shed more light on that later. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, more especially salmonella typhi in the group of salmonella doesn't necessarily cause diarrhea. It causes more of constipation than diarrhea. So the salmonella we are talking about right now is the other um, species of salmonella, especially uh, salmonella and teritis. It has been known to cause more of the salmonella than all the other agents. And then for the mode of transmission, we know that all these agents, including the viral uh, diarrhea, are fecal oral, like she said in here. And then um, in all these cases, in the anamnesis, we are taking the history of disease or the history of life. We realize that uh, in all these cases, the, pa the patient would have had uh, contact with somebody who has had uh, the disease before or somebody who already has the disease. And uh, we know that all these agents, when they enter the body, they have an incubation period. So depending on the incubation period of the agent, the diarrhea manifests itself. So if the patient comes to you and tells you that, for example, the viral cholera, the incubation period is some few hours, average 48 hours. So if the patient comes to you and tells you that um, about two days ago, uh, there was somebody in the house having diarrhea and blah, blah, blah. And then at that point, the patient has diarrhea you can actually consider it as, as, as one of the criteria for this kind of diagnosis. And it should also be noted that salmonellosis, cholera, shigella, and most of the diarrhea diseases all have acute onset in anamnesis. So, uh, especially the infectious ones, not the chronic ones, the infectious ones, most of them have acute onset. And then if you come to examination, if you are examining the patient, you will see that the patient has, because of the diarrhea, and then some of them, okay, sorry, let me mention this, that in the complaints for all these diseases, not only diarrhea the patients will have, for cholera, the patients will have uh, vomiting alongside the diarrhea. And the vomiting is usually fountain-like. It's usually fountain-like. And then there's two in cholera, is they call it rice water, rice water stew, because it is wired with some white substances. They call the scientists say it's a pass. Pass, the white substance, they call it pass. So it is in the form of rice water. So there's two, that is typical for cholera. And then for salmonellosis, there's two, is like um, green pea soup. It's a dark green stew with stuff like green peas. So if you see that kind of stew, you know that it's specific for salmonellosis. And then for shigella, it is, um, they call it rect rectal spit. It is a very, the, 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 the stool is like spit, very small, with a, a large amount of mucus, and then blood. And then uh, the viral infection, the stool is watery and is yellow. Sometimes you see it, it actually looks like uh, the stool in cholera. And then in all these uh, instances, there are other complaints that patients might have. For Shigella, for instance, the patients will have um, pseudo edges to go to the toilet. Like the patient has the edge to go, but when the patient goes, the toilet will not come. And the time the toilet will come, it will be very, very small. For cholera, very frequent and watery. For salmonella, it's also very frequent and watery. And then for salmonella, the, uh, the patient will have abdominal pain, usually in the periambulical region and then the lower regions of the abdomen. And then for Shigella, the patient mostly complains of pain in the left iliac region because there is a um, spastic uh, spasm of the zygoid colon, which causes spastic pain in that left iliac region. But for uh, the viral, viral diarrhea, the pain usually it occurs in children. And children don't, can't really tell where the pain is. So what they do is they usually guard the whole abdomen when you want to touch it. So you know that the, the child actually has some pain in the abdomen alongside the diarrhea. And then, of course, there will also be signs of intoxication. They will all have, in all these cases, they, they, they are uh, high temperature, but more especially in the viral, viral infection, the temperature is subfebrile. And in all the others, at the beginning of the disease, if the, 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 there are no forms of com complications or bacteremia, the, the temperature will be subfebrile. But if there is bacteremia or any form of complication, then the, the temperature can be very, very high. 
And then other forms of intoxication, headache, malaise, lethargy, all those ones. And uh, if we come to the complaint, uh, the anamnes, uh, sorry, the examination, in all these cases, they will have signs of dehydration. So you see that the, depending on the stage of severity, you can tell the stage of the dehydration. But you can see signs like um, sunken eyes, the patient feels very weak, skin tender is reduced, the urine of the patient is usually very concentrated and dark. And then you see that because of the dehydration, also there might be signs that are associated with the cardiovascular system, like um, elevated heart rate, pulse, and stuff like that. And then for um, the laboratory and instrumental diagnosis, in all the bacterial cases, the complete blood count might be the same. You might have um, normal red blood cell counts, but in the case of Shigella, because there is bloody diarrhea, you might have anemia in that case. And uh, in, actually, in all of them, you have leukocytosis with especially neutrophilia, with high levels of neutrophils. But in, um, in the viral diarrhea, you, have, you might have normal erythrocyte counts, but with um, leukocytosis, but with lymphocytosis, not in the neutrophils. So that's what you can use to differentiate between viral and the bacterial infections. And then um, for the biochemical analysis, you see that in all these cases, electrolytes will be decreased because the patients are vomiting and then they are passing out blood crystals. So electrolytes will also decrease. And then um, in the viral infection, it is not only, you know, viruses have different ways of doing their stuff. So they don't only attack the intestinal system, even though it's, an, it's, an, um, it's causing diarrhea. But they cause other symptoms, other cataract signs, like the patients will have uh, cold, the patients will have running nose and stuff. And sometimes in the viral, uh, in the case of uh, the rosa virus, it can affect the liver. Most of these viruses are, end up affecting the liver anyway. So in the biochemical analysis for the viruses, you might, you might see elevated cardiac and uh, liver enzymes, ALT, AST, GGT, in, in that case. And then in rare cases, in rare cases, you find elevated bilirubin eh? because um, if, if the virus is very active and causing damage everywhere, including the liver, that if it actually gets access into the blood and then enters the liver, then there will be other other signs, jaundice and other signs of. of and then um, uh, the, the bacteriological examination of this tool will also show, for example, in cholera, will show the etiologic, etiologic agent. So in cholera, you reveal ribo cholera. In salmonella, you see salmonella enteritis or any other form of salmonella. In shigella, you see the shigella. And then in, in the viral uh, agent, they use viro virology uh, examinations to detect the virus. And sometimes they use serological methods also, like um, uh, neutralization reaction, complement binding reactions, and hemagglutination reactions to find antibodies to all these etiologic agents in the body. So if you use these methods, you find antibodies to shigella, antibodies to salmonella, salmonella antibodies to cholera, and then antibodies to um, the rotavirus. So, uh, and then for the functional diarrhea, you have um, diarrhea, it's more or less like an unexplained diarrhea. Because the patient has diarrhea, the patient doesn't know what happened. And it is usually caused by either a physiological or psychosocial factors. And with psychosocial factors, I mean like a, the patient has stress, or the patient, for example, has series of exams, right, in a very long time. And the patient is always nervous, always has this kind of stress related to this kind of um, whatever is ahead. Or sometimes the patient doesn't even have stress. It's just because the patient has, uh, uh, is having dysfunction of the intestinal system, and so the patient has diarrhea. And then, um, with this kind of diarrhea, they have uh, a criteria for diagnosing it. And it was, uh, the criteria was 
the criteria was first brought up in Rome, so they call it the Rome criteria. So Rome 2 criteria for diagnosis of functional diarrhea states that the, uh, there should be watery, loose watery stool without abdominal pain in about 75% of the stool that the patient has passed. And then the patient should have this complaint for the last three months, like the, the three months before the patient reports to the hospital. And then the first symptom of the disease should be about six months before diagnosis of the disease. So if the patient has um, diarrhea without, without abdominal pain in most of the diarrhea, and the patient has been having this kind of diarrhea for continuously three months, and then it actually started maybe six months and will stop, and then for the last three months, the patient has been having that kind of diarrhea, then you can actually push the diagnosis of functional diarrhea. It does not have um, it's a dominant factor. So if you if you search the stool, or you search in, if you search the stool, you're not going to find any etiologic agent. And then for the genetic diseases, they've already spoken about most of them. Uh, there is celiac school disease, there is galactosemia, there is uh, hypolactasia, and then there is lactose intolerance. And then for the celiac disease, you realize that it's an autoimmune autoimmune disease and it actually comes in association with some other disease that the patient might have. Might have. Like for example, the patient has a, a condition like Addison's disease or the patient has a, a systemic lupus erythematosus or rheumatoid arthritis. There's, all, there's already a, a, an autoimmune process going on in the body. So as soon as the patient eats that, the, the meal with gluten or the meal wheat, oats, those meals, then the patient will have this kind of um, diarrhea. And then for diagnosis of this kind of uh, disease, you usually do endoscopy with biopsy. So if you do the biopsy and you see that the uh, villi of the intestine have been flattened, then you see you, you can think of celiac disease. And then for the other ones I talked about, most of all of them actually have to do with uh, lactose or milk. So if the person cannot tolerate milk, then it means the person has lactose intolerance. And then if the person has um, deficiency of the enzyme galactin 1 uridyl transferase, phosphate uridyl transferase, it means that the patient will actually have accumulation of galactose in the body. And it is not only the diarrhea that they are going to cause, it will cause several other diseases. So if you do a genetic analysis of this kind of thing, and then in the anamnesis, you also notice that somebody in the family probably has that disease. So you can be able to.
how you can take care of the diabetes and how what what we need to in case that there is no doctor to take care of the diabetes. Then what measures, what do you do with these measures to take care of the diabetes? How many measures can we take care of the diabetes? As you all know, um, diarrhea is a um, leading cause of death, especially in Africa. And basically, the care we take as nurses is um, based on the underlying factor of the disease. But one major thing we are looking at is we want to control the complication of the area which is there. In respect to what um, Dr. Axe, I can say, has just said, we try to control one major thing in the area, the loss of electrolytes and blood fluid, which automatically result to death. In that respect, based on the underlying factor, in a general perspective, the first thing we look at is personal hygiene. We look at personal hygiene depends on the underlying factor. We encourage hand washing. We have inpatient and outpatient, and these are measures we take across the board. Hand washing. And we encourage um, bed rest, mostly for this patient, because um, um, internal motility can can speed up the, the movement of um, food into the stomach and do not allow the colon to be able to absorb water, uh, which lead to uh, the expression of the, the stool. I want to ask you, in case where there is no doctor, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It depends on the underlying part. Where there is no doctor, if it is um, any other cause or no, we try to control the loss of fluid. So what do we do? We, we prepare oral rehydration salt for oral rehydration therapy, which is done by six spoons of uh, level teaspoons of salt and one spoon of um, level teaspoon of sugar and one liter of clean water. If it is not clean, you boil it to purify the water. And um, okay, um, what I wanted to share is just a short thing. Uh, you know, we talk about hygiene, but this one thing I want to share is, um, is adaptive immunity. Because one experience I had is um, some people, what can give cause to diarrhea cannot cause to diarrhea. Because uh, from an experience, there is someone who traveled from the States, came to visit a family in the provinces, and the kids they met there, and like this person is trying to maintain hygiene differentiate cops and everything and everything. Unfortunately, the kids from the US got diarrhea. And was wondering why my kids are I kept them clean and everything and these kids are not kept clean. What happened? Struggle to recover the recover from diarrhea. And at the end of the said no, we have to allow them to live with these kids so they build up adaptive humanity as we call it. And then they, they develop some strong things. I know that, I know that, um, she had a lot to talk about the treatment, but I wanted to summarize the drugs. Just some of the drugs that I have. Um, alright, you know, diarrhea, you know, there is one common, I'm asking that you make so much mistakes about. That's why I will try not to rush over to them, at least get to them, I will see. Okay, the first thing you do about uh, diarrhea, like the first, um, approach a, a doctor in nurse or any health to provide them to do. You should try and want to maintain the water and the credit problems like the healthy said. And normally you should give the oral reaction therapy which is um, six tablespoons of sugar, half a teaspoon of salt, and then a result of one liter of water and give the person. Now this treatment is not permanent because it doesn't compensate for transport and alone in the world we lost.
In case you don't have that, you can use other things. There are other things that can maintain that balance. And that is you getting a cup of tea and putting money in the economy and mix it can also serve as an quality for that patient. If you don't have all that on your own, you can boil with chicken broth. Or chicken, boiled chicken broth, but without the fat. That can also compensate for emergency or in the local area where you don't have that treatment. Drugs is usually not the first step in treating diarrhea. It is a very big mistake most people do that when you're having diarrhea, immediately you run and buy the pastatolin or the drink as well and you need to take. You need to understand the positive organism or the, the factor, the positive factor of that diarrhea before you take drug. Because even when you start taking antibiotics, it might even complicate the patient's case. What if it's a viral, like you said, it's a retroviral, retroviral infection. Your antibiotics will be ineffective and the antibiotics will end up causing diarrhea because of what we call this bacteriosis. When that thing kills the normal flora in the intestine, it will give another kind of bacteria, which is called Clostridium difficile, which causes diarrhea. So example of such drugs that we should be careful about is antibiotics. So it's not really the first step you should do. You must have done some um, examination before you confirm if it's a bacterial infection or a viral infection, or if you actually need drug, which is a functional diarrhea, or is a uh, based on infectious or non infectious kind of diarrhea. So there are many other um, kind of medicine you should use. So don't rush to drugs. Don't just buy the other thing. But in case you have that kind of diarrhea, now there are different kind of medicine to treat diarrhea. She said before that the diarrhea would be hypermotility from the stomach, from the GI tract, sorry. And if you have hypermotility, and doctor will realize that, this is because of hypermotility. There's a classical drug that most people use that it works for almost for most type of diarrhea, the trade name is called Imodium. If you know it's called Trubaramine. It's actually not an antibiotic, but it's not an antibiotic, but it works, it's a um, long it and it works very, very well on the GI tract to limit um, motility. There's peptose based on what you call this most compound. This most compound also helps to decrease the amount of frequency, the amount of time the patient runs to the toilet for defecation. So these are classical kind of drugs. Now, the effect of this drug, if you know pharmacology very well, you know what to call myscarinic receptor. Okay. <laughs> Alright, if you are trying to block the um, if you are trying to use the universal stimulation system that causes secretion, that causes stimulation of the GI tract and every other kind of secretion in the body. So you give this um, um, muscarinic drug as not some drugs and not um, there's no class of drug called like anti -diarrhea. You get it? Well some drugs have such effect on diarrhea. Example of such drugs when you have antihistamine. You know, when you have runny nose or you have flu and you need to take some antihistamine, you need to see some symptoms like constipation. Mm -hmm. Or you're having a depression and they're giving some TCD and you begin to see side effects like constipation. So such drugs have effects on diarrhea, but they are not really they are not really for diarrhea, but they have so I don't have time, sorry. Um, so I'll just try and so in case you have time emergency, you can use the ORT from salt water, sugar combination, or you can boil chicken, remove the fat and drink it, or you can buy, you can get your tea, your cup of tea, and you put some honey in it and mix it. So such things can really help you for a short while before you get a professional. There are other things we have to discuss about. I won't call on those companies. I will call on Dr. Francis to summarize everything we talked about in diarrhea briefly and tell us his experience, his real life experience about diarrhea and one or two advice he has for us. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for the good job you've done. The diarrhea, as we have had it from our specialists, is a very common illness. It's also dangerous. Very dangerous in the sense that it kills. But for adults, it is not a big problem because I can say almost even today, today you might see one or, one or two persons having diarrhea, but they don't take it as serious as anything because they know what is true. But for children, it is very, very dangerous. Why is it so? It is so because, especially infants below three years, 
75% of the body weight of children is made up of water. And so when children lose this water, they almost collapse into a short period. And that is why for them, it is very, very dangerous and kills a lot. Now we have had diarrhea. What is diarrhea? We said having frequent loose stools. Frequent water you're used to. That is the best thing. But one of the exact you see, having three or more frequent used to. That is the idea. Now, what we call a talk of the type of diarrhea. So we have different different types with motive, secretory, and all that. In the clinic, when you go to clinical practice, this is another very important. What do you think of acute diarrhea, chronic diarrhea? Is this very acute or is it chronic? This is the main thing to do. Why do you say acute? Acute when it is the one day, the one week. That is, it's acute. Now, chronic is three weeks is now. In between these two, you have one, you call it uh, persistent. That is why it matters to two weeks, you call it persistent. Then, apart from that, apart from that one, you also think of mild, moderate, and severe. And this one is based on the degree of dehydration, because this is what kills. So because of that, you classify it as mild, moderate, and severe. Now, you do this because the mode of treatment, the way of treatment, is different. When it is mild and moderate, it is far less. Or are you understand general? Like I just said, they have prepared ones in sachets that they can use it to, to, to mix with one liter of water and drink as much as possible. Or you can just do the local, local and the mixture of the one level teaspoon of salt plus uh, six level teaspoon of uh, sugar and mix it with uh, one liter of, uh, of uh, clean water. And you drink it as much as possible and it does the work. Or even if we are these ones are not, if you are not able to do that, and if you are in the real place, where there's coconut, just on ripe coconut work does the magic. So these are very important. Then when it comes to severe, in severe case it means you have to put infection because at that time the patient is already collapsed and you cannot even take, take uh, other, other, other things. The person is lethargic, is weak, almost unconscious, is in shock, so you need to use uh, a lot of infusion. Lingus lactate, uh, nine cells to do the These are the things that are commonly used. Then when you talk of there's also this collective agent that you have to be very, very serious. We have mentality here, cholera. We have different, different types, virus, um, and bacteria, and the protozoa, parasitic. Under parasitic, you have protozoans and then uh, helminths too, worms. But the one of the most dangerous is the cholera, the people cholera. It is very, very important because it kills, it has endemic areas, endemic disorders. It is in some areas, particular areas, it is always experienced. Then you have pandemic spread. You have pandemic, pandemic that is spread between countries. You see, very very critical, you also have epidemic. Epidemic is saying that it spreads very fast. It is in the southern area. So that is very important. And uh, fortunately, fortunately, awareness is becoming uh, so much that the death from this diarrhea is reducing, especially in the developing countries where the hygiene condition is not so much. Availability of uh, portable water is limited, and then the way of disposing of our disposal is also not well um, uh, proper. So we have to the good. The good thing is that we have water that is widely distributed, and because of that, and then people also are aware how, how to use this poor and because of that, the dead weight is reduced. And if you look at it if you, from the age of fast, 19 of the future are 5 million deaths of children from the rear. Children below 5 years in the rear. In 1990, it reduced up to 3.2 million deaths. And then by 2003, it went down to 1 to 6. So these are facts showing that this awareness is coming. Probably the way of disposal of uh, uh, waste. Uh, but it's still a dangerous food. Now, uh, fortunately for us in Canada, we also have a vaccine. 
if the vaccine is excused, when still when you're going to the general period, clear vaccines. The last ones will take last for six months. And so whenever you're traveling to any place where it's endemic, in Africa there are certain places that are endemic. Even in India, it is very endemic. In fact, there is a place in Bangladesh that they have a type of elder, the second type of elder, and it is called the death. That is very, very important. So whenever you're traveling to those places, you are advised to take the vaccine. And then we have to be in fact in this, according to GD, what he has said, it is a fact. When you have diarrhea, the most important thing is not the drugs. In fact, it is known that diarrhea, actually diarrhea is a limiting, it's a self-limiting disease. Without taking any drug, if you start now and after three days, you see that you need to go down. The most important thing is how to maintain your hydration. And so once you have diarrhea, the most important thing is go oh, out to take to stabilize yourself. You can be going to the toilet and passing through up to 24 times, 20 times a day. But as far as you are taking your placing the most, you do not have problems. So the most important thing is the hydration. Now I want to give us just a little advice. We know that diarrhea is very common. But in a country, the preventive measures is very, very important. And so we have to take this thing into consideration. These are very most important things. I want to bring you many. Wash regular washing of hands. Good waste disposal. In fact, whenever you get to the toilet, you should invite that attitude. Whenever you go to the toilet, after the toilet, you need to wash your hands. And then, for the for nursing mothers and women in nursing mothers, before you feed your baby, before you feed your infant, you must wash your hands. After going to the toilet, you wash your hands. And even after you change your nap and nap your baby, you do not wash your hands. Because why do you do so? You know that, as I've said earlier, in the bodies of infants are mainly water, 75%. And so if you don't practice this, this, this way, you will end up carrying the pathogenic organism from hand to mouth. And so the, the, the whole cycle will continue to, to revolve. And the real problem will be there. And you know what happens? Malnutrition of course. Because when you were passing when you were passing through, no time to so all the so so all these so And that's a very, very important thing. And then for the for everybody, I would like to say that even though we know that our is common, let us know that it gives. And what is that thing we are doing? We must be sure proper. And if we do the right thing, we will come in. Okay, now I would like to thank everybody and many the participants for their time to brought out to come and discuss with us. We don't have enough time. We have taken questions about the uh, one that we would like that this, they are already running us to do this too. So we will end the discussion without taking questions. But if you have a better question, can get across to us and answer you. So, once more, let us start. Uh, please, thank you very much for your time. And you know, I think there's something good we need to be doing to encourage ourselves to learn. But it has happened that we should have requested for more time than before. But please, I think our next month meeting, we should also try and come a bit early. This one we at one twenty-five, but if you look at what went in, it requires more time. And if you have interacted, there will be more to learn or much to learn. We were thinking that an option would be we would go and continue in the common room, like with questions and interactions, as we take our refreshments, you know. Because for now, we have some little thing we have to break, you know, we have some break we have to break together. So we will move to the ninth floor. As we take in that one, then we can also be asking questions. Would that be okay? No, would that be okay? So that someone will not carry the question. Would that, is, is that okay? 
It's okay. Do you agree with that so that we can go there? As you take your uh, meat file and that thing, you can be asking questions. Thank you very much. Now, we would like to pray, and after that, 